Worship you. 
Some know and some don't. <clears throat> Lord, the month of June, Logan went home to be with you. The month of June has been hard for Mark. God, I have failed you this month, Lord, nearly every month, but Lord, especially this month. God, I have not been what I should be what I've been taught to be. God, you can't come to this church without changing. Oh God, without when you get up here, Lord, confessing your sins. Because yes, Lord. Lord, I think that's in the Bible somewhere, yeah. So God, I failed you. Lord, I am sorry. I failed my wife. You give us a helper, Lord. In the Bible, you said, I'll make a helper for you. Lord, God, you know I need a helper. Mm. Lord, I need you most, but I need a helper. I thank you for Melissa. Lord, everybody sitting in here has got been through things. If they haven't, I'm sorry they're going to go through some things. 
Because that's what Jesus Christ said. But he also said, this is what I like, Lord, I'll never leave you. Yeah. I'll never forsake you. Amen. God, I won't stop loving you. Amen. You won't stop helping me. The song says, I am the way maker. Yes, Lord. I am the light in the darkness. Everybody goes through darkness. God, this is not about me. This is not about Logan. Father, this is about your son. This is about what you've done. You put him on that cross for me and everybody in here. Lord, my prayer is if there's one in here that don't know Jesus Christ, don't know that love, don't know that forgiveness, don't know that help, don't know the way maker, the truth, the light, all the above, God, I pray today that they'll step out of that aisle. God, you like you've done me, you give them courage when I was just 12. Lord, I was shaking them shoes, Lord. It wasn't about them. It wasn't about you. It was about the people. It was just the people that scared me to death. God, give them the courage to step out. Acknowledge that love, that forgiveness. We're going to leave here one day. It could be today. Logan probably had no intentions when he crunked that truck up Father's Day. That, that was his last day here. I didn't know. Mike Ridge, he touched me on the back. I thought it was my mom passed away. She'd been laying eight years in the bed. I said, thank you, Lord. She's gone home. He said, hold on, son. This ain't your mama. Pastor Jeff met me in the hallway. God told me, he said, this is your son. And he said, I'm going to be with you. And I said, well, Lord, you better be. You're going to need to be. Chris Miller, Rodney Bigham put me in the car, truck. And we went out there and I held him. And I told him, this ain't goodbye. This is just a separation. I'm going to miss you. And I have. And it hadn't been easy. But God has always been there with me. Lord, I thank you for that. For every second, every breath, God, you give me. You've always been there with me. That's for everybody in this room. Lord, I pray for every hurt, every pain, every husband, every wife, every son and every daughter, everyone in this room, God. Touch them. Meet them where they're at. Meet their needs. Only you know them. From the inside out, God, help them. Lord, just thank you again for an opportunity to give. Lord, bless the offering. Bless the gift and the giver. Thank you for this pastor for these singers, for everyone in this church. Touch them in a special way. In Christ's holy name. Amen. 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 Amen.
this song did was kind of tee up and I feel really good about the message that we have today. I'm going to read you a little thing that came off Facebook. It's, uh, it was posted by, reposted by Zach. It says, everything hinges on your view of scripture. Either scripture will be the lens through which you view, view the world or the world, its science, its politics, and its worldview will be the lens through which you view Scripture. Ultimately, one or the other will be your authority. Mm. One or the other will be your authority. Either the world will be your authority and you will judge Scripture by what the world says and does, or the Scripture will be your authority and you will judge the world by what the Word says, by what God has said. Now, I'm going to turn this thing off because I don't trust that do not disturb. And I don't trust that my friends who know I'm preaching on Sunday morning won't try to call me. <laughs> but if you have your Bible, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to go to a couple places. I want you to go to Matthew 22 and Genesis chapter 3 and Romans chapter 5. Matthew 22. We're going to put them up on the big screen too. Matthew 22, Genesis chapter 3. And Romans chapter 5, we'll end up in Romans chapter 8, but you'll already be there, so we won't have to get marked that one. I want to talk to you this morning about what's driving the chaos in our world right now. And what often drives the chaos in our own personal world. Of course, the generic overarching word, that catch, the catch-all phrase, is sin. But sin has an effect. And that effect is death, but death comes in all kinds of various forms and shapes. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is the way that death comes to us and the way that death came to us in the form of insecurity. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 34, there are some people that are putting Jesus to the test. <clears throat> it was the Pharisees the first time, or, or the Sadducees the first time, in verses 23 through 33, but now it's the Pharisees' time, and it says, but when the Pharisees, verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, that's Jesus, they gathered together, and then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, meaning that all the do's and the don'ts can be summed up in these two verses, in these two commandments. He says, and I want to focus on the second one in verse 39. It says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The word as means, or as we love ourselves means, in the same manner, according to the same means, or even as. But here's the problem. Here's the problem that we have with that commandment. What if we don't love ourselves? What if we don't love ourselves? Then how am I ever going to love someone else? And you go, Pastor Randy, I thought that the whole thesis of, of the gospel was that you would not love yourself. No, it says that you would deny yourself. It didn't say love yourself. Now, we're going to define what that means in just a minute. But let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and look at what happened when Adam sinned. In Genesis chapter 3, when Adam sinned, let's go to verse 6. <clears throat> Actually, uh, 7 is good. They ate the fruit. Y'all know the deal. Y'all know the story. Heard it a thousand times. Then the eyes of them 
were opened. In other words, their conscience was awakened. The eyes of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, notice that the first thing, uh, ultimately, we know they died spiritually, but we don't see that. We see the effect of that, and the effect of that is, is that their conscience was awakened. They became self-conscious. That's what we say in, in Bible teaching is we became, they became self-conscious, and all of a sudden they realized that they were naked. Now, Satan had come to them and had promised them autonomy, which means self-rule. He said... Did God indeed say, and they said yes, and he said, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of the fruit, you will become like or as God. In other words, God's holding out on you. You can't trust him. He threatens you with death, but death will not come. What he's not telling you is that when you eat the fruit, you're going to be like God. In other words, you're going to be in charge, and you're going to have uh, the, all the authority, and hence you will have all the security. You will be secure because you will be the one that's in charge. You'll be like God. And so they believed the lie, and they ate the fruit, and what Satan promised and what sin promised, that they would have authority and security, it did not provide that. It provided the opposite of that. It provided uh, bondage to Satan and to sin and insecurity. That's what exactly, it promised one thing, but delivered the other, and in doing so, revealed to them that what they were already secure, that they were already loved and accepted, that they had no reason for shame because they were loved by God. They developed what we call in modern-day uh, psychology today an inferiority complex. Immediately, what came into their conscience, what was awakened within them, what sin immediately brought forth was shame, and guilt and a sense of rejection and a feeling of inadequacy. Hence, the first thing that they did was recognize their own nakedness. And then they, the scripture says that they took fig leaves and sewed the fig leaves together the, to make themselves coverings, to cover their nakedness. They did that because they sensed that they were inadequate or that they had been rejected. And they developed this shame and guilt and sense of rejection and inadequacy. And their, what we call their self-esteem or self-love was lost. Now hold on with me there before you start thinking, the pastor ain't, I don't get this self-love stuff. Watch this now. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they had great self-esteem. Self-esteem is nothing more than how you perceive yourself and how you perceive that other people perceive you. So it's your self-assessment and it's your belief in how everybody else sees you. And they had great confidence. They had great self-esteem because every emotional, physical, spiritual need that they had was being met in God. That God was their security. Amen. That God himself was their esteem. That God's provision and protection is what esteemed, made them esteem themselves because they judged themselves to be esteemed by God. But sin came along, Satan came along and says, God does not esteem you, God does not love you. He's actually trying to hold you down. He's trying to keep you back. He's trying to rob you of something that you can have, which is your own authority and exercise your own will. Are y'all seeing how this is working? And it, before they fell, they had everything that Satan was promising them. He just convinced them that they didn't have it. He convinced them that they didn't have it, but that they could have it if they disobeyed God. And they found out that what they really wanted, they had all along. But when they sinned, they lost it. They had great security because they were loved by God. In other words, man's self-esteem and his perception of himself in the beginning before sin was with the understanding that he was valued and loved and cared for by God. Amen. That was his self-esteem. 
That's what made him feel good about himself was that God felt good about him. He was convinced that God loved him, that God was going to care for him. Now you say, Pastor Randy, this does not hold true. Uh, I know some people that, you know, they're, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I know some people who are not insecure. They're narcissists. They are people who love themselves to an extreme. I know some people that really love themselves. Now, you're, you're, you are right, but let's walk through this. Look up the word narcissism or narcissistic. Here's what it means. Extreme self-love, self-adoration. To the point that they think that they're better than other people. They think that they're better, better than other people. This is what we would call a racist. That they think that they're better because they're a certain color or they're not a certain color. But here's what narcissists do. They, they lack empathy for people because they think so highly of themselves and it's all about them. But here's what... Here's what you, you have to keep reading in the definition of narcissism to get to this. Here's what it says. A narcissistic, that is an extremely self-loving person, is in constant need of over-exaggerated admiration. They need somebody to brag on them all the time. They need somebody to tell them how good they are all the time. Which tells you that they don't really love themselves, they're really insecure, and they are the most insecure people to the point that they've rebounded in thinking that they're all that in a bag of chips, but they need people to tell them that. And they're always going to gravitate towards people that's going to make them feel good about themselves. Now listen, guys. Now You say, Pastor Rita, I don't want to raise my hand, but that's, that's me. I, I, want to be, I want to be around people that make me feel good about myself all the time. And you know why that is? Because, listen, because we were born into sin. We were born into sin. And every single person in this room, I don't care if you've saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. Every single person in this room, if not daily, weekly, deals with insecurity. Deals with insecurity. You say, Pastor Randy, I don't believe it. If you go buy the clothes that are on TV, you're insecure. Because you feel like the clothes on TV make me acceptable to other people. If you're trying to buy a house in a certain area code, you're insecure if you've got to live there to feel good about yourself. If you drive a certain vehicle because everybody else has got one, uh, you are insecure because you feel like that's what you've got to have to belong. If you wear your haircut like everybody else wears their haircut, if you grew a beard because everybody else grew a beard, if you grew a goatee because everybody else grew a goatee, if you got a tattoo because everybody else got a tattoo, if you slept around because everybody else slept around, if you drank beer because everybody else drank beer, if you party because everybody else party, you are insecure. All of those things are self-destructive things. All of those things are fig leaves. Every one of those things are fig leaves because we don't feel like, even in the church, we don't feel like that we're loved and accepted unless we look like everybody that we perceive to be loved and accepted. Pastor Randy's popular. He wears blue jeans and boots. I'm going to give me some. <laughs> he wears a short haircut. I'm going to cut my hair short. You don't know that I used to wear my hair long and if it was still thick and black, I still would. You don't, see, you don't understand that. You said, matter of fact, I'm going to drive a wedge in between my front teeth. <laughs> The only remedy to insecurity is the gospel. The only remedy to insecurity is the gospel. The only remedy to insecurity is the gospel. Now listen, it's only through the gospel, it's only through Christ that our deepest and most intense needs are met. It's only through the fact that God loves us and provided his son Jesus Christ for us. But not only does it bring insecurity, not only did Adam's sin bring insecurity into our life so that now we're running around trying to figure out which fig leaf we need to put on into our uh, wardrobe so that we can cover up our weaknesses, but, but it also convinced Adam and Eve, the next verse says, and they heard the Lord, look at verse 8, in chapter 3, verse 8, let me turn back over there. In chapter 3, verse 8, look at what it did. 
And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, from uh, Lord God among the trees of the garden. So not only did sin bring insecurity, but sin duped them into believing. It deceived them into believing that God had indeed rejected them. That God had indeed become vengeful. That God had indeed become harsh. That God had indeed become unmerciful and unloving to them. They thought that because they were naked, God didn't love them anymore. They thought that because they were naked, God wasn't going to be gracious to them anymore. And so they hid themselves. So lie, the, the, the sin of Adam and Eve brought insecurity into our lives. It's in every person on this planet, even now to some degree. Every person now. You're worried about the bags under your eyes, the thinning of your hair, the gray, you know, the sagging waistline, uh, the loss of muscle mass. You know, the wrinkly skin, the loss of vision, you're going, oh my God, i got to stop this thing, you know. Slow this down. And it's because you're insecure. We're insecure. And not only did it bring that, but it also convinced us that God was not good anymore. And that God had indeed rejected us. And this insecurity and this belief that God is unloving came into the life of every person. And it's compounded by the world that we live in because the world is insecure. The world is under the curse. The world is in sin. And so here's what the world says. If you look like this, live like this, act like this, talk like this, live over here, drive that and act this way, you will be loved. All of marketing and all of, uh, of uh, consumerism is driven by, by communicating to you and I, that's the general public, your intense need of having this. And if you have this, you will not, everything will be cool. And you've said it. God, if I can just have this much money in the bank. God, if I could just drive, God, if I could just go out with her. God, if I could just marry him. And you know that 15 minutes after you start feeling comfortable with each other and with your money and all of that, the next thing you know is you wake up and it's not enough. She, it's just not enough. I thought she was it, Pastor Randy, but her breath stinks. I thought that this much money was what it took, but houses has gone up. You know, I thought that he was it, but he's gotten fat and his hair's falling out. I thought that this was it. I thought living over here, but I didn't understand that I still have to mow the grass when I live over there and that the property taxes are higher over there. Amen. And so I just didn't know that uh, I thought that if I could get that and have that and be that and do that, that I would feel good about myself. Only to find out that you joined another group of people who don't feel good about themselves either. That's right. That's right. The rich need to be richer. The good looking need to be more good looking. The ugly just need a break. I mean, it's all down the line. We just need something else, right? We just need something else. So life, life compounds this. I'm just going to go through this. Here's what makes insecurity even worse. To be rejected. Literally. I remember, I never will forget in Band of Brothers years ago, years ago, that we went through, uh, uh, what was the thing, manhood, authentic manhood? Yeah. And I found out in our small groups that we had a, many, many men in our congregation that had never been told by their fathers that they were loved by their fathers. You know what that does? That takes insecurity to the third, to the third degree. It just compounds it. When your kids wake up and, and daddy's not there anymore, or mama has left them, or, or when, boy, uh, let's break it on down in high school, when your boyfriend breaks up with you right before the prom, and it's the sense of rejection, or you didn't get a birthday present from somebody, or nobody called you, or your friends abandoned you, it's the sense of rejection, it just piles on. Number two, trauma. For people that are abused or abandoned, for for Broken homes and divorces, traumatic events in people's lives, it just compounds the problem. Poor body image by comparison. Now, the only reason you don't feel good about your body is because you see everybody else's body. If you didn't see everybody else's body, you would not care about what your body looked like. Every time I get amen. Right. If I was the only one around here, I would not care what my body looked like because my body's the only body. But the reason I care about what my body looks like is because I see your body and his body, and their body, and her body, and you know what I'm saying? And so what happens is, is when I see you, I start comparing myself. Well, he's taller than I am. She's thinner than I am. 
Her hair's prettier. Her hair's thicker. Her, my, my straight hair, I wish it had curls. My curly hair, I wish it was straight. Do you see how stupid that is? But yet we all fall into the trap. And it even goes to color. Okay, I, my son that I've adopted, because most of us are white in our family, although there are some exceptions, my son, he came to me and he said, Papa, I wish I was brown. You know why he wishes he was brown? Because everybody that loves him around him is white. So he wishes he was brown. In other words, he thinks, he thinks in his mind that his color has made a difference in how much he's loved. He thinks that he doesn't fit into the family because it's white, 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 brown, white, white, brown, white, 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 brown. Well, the whites have it. So what do the browns do? Sense of rejection. And it just piles on to our insecurity. Failures. Lost your job. Your marriage broke up. You didn't graduate. Or you struggled academically or athletically. And you consider that to be a failure. And then lastly, I put this one down, poverty. Poverty compounds insecurity because it is considered to be by the individual a perceived personal failure. I'm poor, so therefore I have failed. And it is compounded by the fact that our culture and our insecure world that tells you it's secure, but it's not secure. I mean, if, if being a multi-billionaire made you secure, you wouldn't be trying to get the, the 11th billion. Can I get a witness? So we have an insecure world that's selling us a lie that says if you drive this, live there, have her do that, you can be secure. And they are insecure. And so they say you got to have this much money and live in this kind of vehicle and wear these kind of clothes and drive that kind of car or you are a failure. And so people that live in poverty or below a certain socioeconomic line, they see themselves as failures. And when they look into the future, they see nothing changing. So they lose hope. And all of these things combine to bring a self-destructive behavior because then they all, we all, begin to grasp our fig leaves and begin to try to gain security which cannot be gained. And the, consequently, we become resentful, just like Adam and Eve, resentful, angry, blaming everybody else, jealous, and eventually violent. When Cain, when Cain and Abel, raised by Adam and Eve, taught to bring a sacrifice to God, they both brought their sacrifices. One brought, brought a sacrifice of blood as he had been taught. The other brought a sacrifice of his own good works, the work of his hand out of his garden. God said, I accept Abel's sacrifice because it's the blood. Cain, I reject your sacrifice because it's not of the blood. And the Bible says that Cain's countenance fell. And then God came to him and Randy's paraphrase. Why well, you got that sad look on your face? I didn't reject you. I rejected your sacrifice. Now, if you will do what you know to do and bring me the right sacrifice, you'll be accepted. But you know what Cain did? Cain did like everybody else in the world. He felt like he had been rejected. So instead of doing what everybody else was doing, like Abel, instead of doing what Abel was doing, instead of doing what Abel did, instead of getting up and getting a, and say, Abel, I will swap you some of my corn for one of your lambs so that I can bring God an acceptable sacrifice. There was all kind of things he could have done. But instead of getting up off his butt and doing what God told him to do and the way God told him to do it, you know what he did? He killed Abel. We always have a tendency to destroy, to kill, to cripple, to silence, or to tear down anything that's making me feel bad about myself. That's why we're burning down cities and snatching down statues. And that's why we have this racial divide and war back and forth is because you make me feel good about myself and you don't make me feel good about myself. And now we are at war with one another. Because the enemy has brought up to the top this thing called insecurity. Like a statue is going to make me feel good about myself or a school or a song or the flag for God's sake is going to make me feel bad about myself? A flag? 
is going to make me feel bad about myself? Come on. I hate our country. It makes me feel bad about myself. Then move. Go to China and see if you feel better about yourself. Go to Russia. Go to North Korea. I guarantee you, you will run back here. You will crawl back here so that you can be comfortable in your insecurity. It cannot, it cannot bring security. The only thing that can bring security is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Right. Only God can restore the security that sin stole from me. Amen. Only God, the sin killer, can kill, can restore the security that Christ gave to me. The Bible said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I might have been an insecure poor man. Now, when I met Christ, I might still be poor, but I'm not insecure. I might have been an insecure drunk, but since I met Christ, I may be still insecure, but I ain't a drunk. And then we have to turn around and find this security and the one who sobered me up and the one who saved me from our sin. The one who did it because he loved us. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16 and 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed upon him would not perish but have everlasting life. Paul said it this way, This is a worthy saying. This is true and a worthy saying that God came into the world to save sinners. Amen. Verse 17, we always leave it off in the gospel. But it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. In other words, to make fun of our nakedness. But the world through him might be saved, restored, reconciled, and have his security given back to him. His hope brought back to him. His future brought back to him. Grace brought back to him. Mercy brought back to him. It was Christ that did that. In Romans 5, 6 through 8, I told you we were going to go there. And let's just read this really quickly. Put it up on the screen for me, Jimmy, if you don't mind. Watch this now. Let's just read it together. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. Yeah. That is where we get, that is where we reclaim our self-esteem. Because God esteemed us with his own love. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sorry, low down, unforgiving, irrational, perverted, self-centered, guilty sinners wallowing in insecurity, Christ died for us. You can't ever get so sorry God won't love you. Because you were as sorry as you could be and Jesus died for you. You were as sorry. We, are, we were as sorry as we could be. And Jesus still died for us. That means that he values you. Amen. Not your polo. Not your caddy. Not your house. Not your degree. Not your hair. Not your nails. And not your skin. Or its color. He valued you. He valued you. You see, there's no po sinners and rich sinners. There's no black sinners and white sinners. There's no Asian sinners and Hispanic sinners. There's no smart sinners and stupid sinners. There's no employed sinners and, and unemployed sinners. There's no good sinners and then really bad sinners. They're sinners, and that's as bad as you can possibly get. Amen. But God demonstrated wow. his own love towards us in that while we were as sorry as you could possibly be, he sent Jesus Amen. to die 
for us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Can you imagine that? Can you, you say, Pastor Randy, I wasn't all that bad. Oh, you're just a narcissistic sinner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pastor Randy, I was bad, but he was worse. Oh, now you're just a judgmental sinner. Now you're a prejudicial sinner. Now you're a prejudicial sinner. I was bad, he was worse. It, there is no qualification in sin. The wages of sin is death. Death is dead. You know, it, and they like kind of dead, more dead, 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 or deadest. It's dead. Sorry as can be. You need to start reading that. For a while, we were still sorry as I could possibly be. God sent his son to die for me. And by doing that, he reestablished and made a way for us to regain our self-esteem or our self-respect or otherwise known as our security. The Bible says in John 8, 31 and 32, did we have that one? Did I give you? Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, somebody hold up your word if you got it. If it's on your phone, hold it up. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Hold it up, come on. You are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. Hallelujah. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Here's what it means. Just exactly what we said at the beginning of the service. Either this will define how you see yourself, or that will define how you see yourself. But you cannot consistently live apart. I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this to you. Neil Anderson in his book Bondage Break. Here's what he said. Quote, the most, I think we have that. Here we go. Let's read up here. The most important belief we possess is a true knowledge of who God is. Amen. Now, the reason, I'm going to stop right there. The reason is, is because sin and Satan convinced us that God wasn't good convinced Adam and we believe that today we believe that God we cannot believe that God is entirely good we possess true knowledge of who God is why is that important because the second most important belief is who we are as children of God if you get the first one wrong the second one will always be wrong if you don't know who God is you'll never know who you are as a child of God Amen. because we cannot consistently behave in a way that is inconsistent with how we perceive ourselves. The way we live our life tells the world about what we believe about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? That's what the scripture tells us, Paul tells us, that godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment. Are you content? Now you said, I'm not, it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily talking about, it was in context talking about either the absence of or the provision of uh, goods and services, materialism and things like that. But are you, are you content with who you are? You say, well, Pastor Randy, I could stand to be smart. I, I could too. We need to stay. Well, Pastor Randy, I, I could stand to, to not be so lazy. I'm getting sorrier by the day. Uh, and, and, and I am too. Pastor Randy, I could stand to be a little bit more disciplined in my life. Now. Me too. But how do you feel about yourself? In other words, do you respect yourself and do you, do you believe that God loves you and does that make you secure? That if, that if none of these other things change in your life, that you, that you and I don't become smarter, that you and I uh, become even more and more lazy, that you and I uh, lack discipline in our lives, are we still secure in the fact that God, God came to save sinners of who I am she? Do you believe that? That's what contentment Amen. is. Contentment is going to bed, relaxing and resting in the one who said he loved you and that he would never leave you or forsake you, regardless of the area code you sleep in, regardless of the car you drive, regardless of the skin color that you have or the clothes that you wear, Amen. or regardless of the fact that you are employed or unemployed, that God still loves you. And that God couldn't love you more than he loves me. And God couldn't love me less than he loves you. Are you yeah. Most people are not content in that. <clears throat> you don't have this, so I'm just going to read it. He went on to say, the more we reaffirm who we are in Christ, the more our behavior will begin to reflect our true identity. The more we go over who we really are, the more we will begin to live out our true identity. He goes on to say that we do not serve God to gain acceptance, but that the fact that we are accepted, we therefore serve God. We don't follow God so that he'll love us, 
but he loves us, therefore we follow God. It's not what I do that determines who I am. It's who I am that determines what I do. It's who I am that determines what I do. In Christ, in Christ, somebody say in Christ. Christ. I'm just going to give you some of the things that we are and let this minister to you. Sean, come on up here. In Christ, we are, you are, I am, accepted, adopted, God's child, Jesus' friend, justified, forgiven, raised up, reconciled to God, redeemed from destruction, crowned with loving kindness, a member of God's family, anointed, blessed, secure, uncondemned, sealed with the Holy Spirit, never alone, complete, seated in heavenly places, a citizen of heaven, one who possesses a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind, one who possesses the authority over the devil and his demons and every evil work. You are the branch of the true vine. You are welcomed in the throne room of God. You are a fruitful branch of the true vine. You're on God's side. God is for you. You are the salt and you are the light of the earth. We are the ministers of reconciliation. We are the ambassadors of heaven. We dine at the king's table. We are assured of heaven. We have no fear of death. We overcome the wicked one. We walk with God. God talks with me. We have the mind of Christ. His mercy and goodness follow me. Angels watch over me. I possess wisdom and discernment. And through the love of God, I overcome all things. And that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. I'm going to go over it again. I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to say them after me to yourself. In Christ, I am accepted, adopted, God's child, Jesus' friend, forgiven, justified, raised up, reconciled to God, redeemed from destruction, crowned with loving kindness, a member of God's family, anointed, blessed, secure, uncondemned, sealed with the Holy Spirit, never alone, complete in Christ, seated in heavenly places in Christ, a citizen of heaven. I have a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. I possess authority over devils and demons and every evil force. I am a branch of the true vine. I am welcome in the throne room of grace. I am a fruitful vine. I'm on God's side. He is for me. I am the salt and the light of the earth. I am a minister of reconciliation, an ambassador of heaven. I dine at the king's table. I am assured of heaven. I have no fear of death. I overcome the wicked one. I walk with God and God talks with me. I have the mind of Christ. Mercy and goodness follow me. Angels watch over me. I possess wisdom and discernment, and I am an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And I am persuaded that He is able to keep my soul until the day of redemption. I am persuaded that He loves me. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor anything good nor evil shall ever separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. I am secure in Christ. I am complete in Christ. I am loved in Christ. I have a home in Christ. I have a promise in Christ. I have a future in Christ. I have a purpose in Christ. I am loved. I'm redeemed. I'm forgiven. I am secure in my heavenly Father who loved me and gave himself for me. If that is your testimony, you need to rehearse it. You need to shout it. You need to pray it. You need to believe it. And you need to come to this altar this morning. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hearts. Bend down in your knee and thank God Almighty that a lot of things are going to happen in this world, but I can never be moved for I am founded on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ, rooted and grounded and built up in His love, steadfast and immovable. This is your time now to reaffirm that before the Lord. There's a chair that waits for you And a friend who understands Everything you're going through Don't let
let the enemy talk you into poor mouthing. Don't let the enemy cause you to put more fig leaves on. A fig leaf ain't nothing but an excuse. It's a problem. It's a lie. Trust the Lord. There's a light of hope that's Come on. Won't you come and take your place? Bring it all to the table. It's nothing here you ain't seen before. All your sin, all your sorrow, and your sadness. There's a Savior and He calls. Bring it all to the table. Come on, just speak His love over your life. Speak His favor you over your life. The way you Call yourself blessed and give God the glory. The fears that hold you. Call yourself complete and give God the glory. Through the cross you've been Call yourself secure and then give God the glory. As you are. Call yourself rich in all things and then give God the glory. To the table. Call yourself anointed and then give God the glory. Call yourself accepted and then give God the glory. Call yourself highly favored and then give God the glory. Call yourself uncondemned and then give God the glory. That's why the Bible says come boldly to the throne room of grace. Because Jesus made a way. self-hatred and self-loathing of all the things that you have done Amen. define who you are. Amen. Okay? Get your word. Get this word. And listen to this word. Not CNN. Listen to this word. Not Fox News. Listen to this word. Not the naysayers. Listen to this word. Not Antifa. Listen to this word. Listen to this word. Let this be the defined definition of who you are. And then go live it out. And go love it out. Because God loves you. Amen? Amen. We love you. Y'all have a great day. Be careful.